Praise be Jesus and Mary. Amen. As much as we'd like to comment on today's feast and on today's gospel, we're going to continue to persevere through our discussion on the Ten Commandments still in the Sixth Commandment. You shall not commit adultery. We'll speak specifically today about the sin of divorce. The Catechism speaks about divorce in paragraphs 2382 through 2386. Paragraph 2382 says, The Lord Jesus insisted on the original intention of the Creator who willed that marriage be indissoluble. And the Catechism quotes Canon Law there, Canon 1141, which says that between those who are baptized, quote, a ratified and consummated marriage cannot be dissolved by any human power or for any reason other than death, unquote. So marriage is ratified when the consent to marry is validly exchanged between the two persons. It's consummated when or after they engage in the conjugal act. So the Catechism also says in paragraph 2384, divorce is a grave offense against the natural law. So even naturally speaking, divorce is understood to be a bad thing. It claims to break the contracts as the Catechism to which the spouse has freely consented to live with each other until death. Divorce does injury to the covenant of salvation of which sacramental marriage is the sign. Contracting a new union, even if it is recognized by civil law as to the gravity of the rupture, the remarried spouse is then in a situation of public and permanent adultery, unquote, says the Catechism. And one paragraph before that, paragraph 2383, the Catechism says that the separation of spouses while maintaining the marriage bond can be legitimate in certain situations provided for by canon law. And it's what notes the possibility of civil divorce. It says this, If civil divorce remains the only possible way of ensuring certain legal rights, the care of the children, or the protection of inheritance, it can be tolerated and doesn't constitute a moral offense. So sometimes civil divorce is the only way or the safest way to protect oneself, and the church understands that. In paragraph 2386, we read this, it can happen that one of the spouses is the innocent victim of a divorce decreed by civil law. The spouse, therefore, has not contravened the moral law. There's considerable difference between a spouse who has sincerely tried to be faithful to the sacrament of marriage and is unjustly abandoned, and the one through his own grave fault, who through his own grave fault destroys a canonically valid marriage, unquote. unquote. Question, what about when Jesus says in the gospel, he says, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. What about that, Matthew 19, 9? Is our Lord making a concession there that if your spouse is unfaithful, you can divorce her or him and marry someone else? That's how Protestants tend to interpret that. They call it the exception clause, except for unchastity. The Greek word for unchastity there is porneia. Well, keep in mind that in the context of that passage, Jesus' disciples were saying that celibacy is preferable precisely because they understood our Lord's teaching to be very strict about this problem on this question. That being said, there are three interpretations of the exception clause which are in harmony with Jesus' teaching on the indissolubility indissolubility of marriage. I can't even pronounce that word. That's a tough one. I should have practiced before the homily started. The first one comes from the fathers of the church. The first explanation, several of them say that Jesus allowed for divorce in cases of serious sexual sin, such as adultery, but he never permitted remarriage after divorce. So spouses can be separate by a legal arrangement of living apart, but they can't break the marriage bond and remarry. That's actually the interpretation which is in line with St. Paul when he says in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 through 11, that a separated couple has only two options. Either they, they can reconcile with each other or they have to remain single. So that's the first interpretation. The second interpretation is called the Levitical Law View. It interprets unchastity in Matthew 19, 9 as invalid marriages in which the spouses are too closely related. 
In that, clay, in that case, except for unchastity means except when unlawful unions exist because they're too near to blood relations. In those cases, a valid marriage actually never really existed. In the Old Testament book of Leviticus, Leviticus 18, unchastity refers to prohibited marriages between kinsfolk. And in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 and 2, that same word for unchastity, porneia, it clearly is talking about an illicit union of a man with his father's wife. So that's a second interpretation that lines up with the church's teaching. A third one is called the no comment view. According to this view, Jesus set aside Jewish debates over the grounds of divorce in the Old Covenant since he's essentially revoking the Old Testament concession on divorce. He brackets the whole itch issue and sets it off really uh, to the side as irrelevant. So except for unchastity means regardless of the Old Testament grounds of divorce, regardless of what they said in the past. In the discourse there in Matthew 19, Jesus refuses even to comment on the verse in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, that was presented to him. He doesn't even make a word about that verse. In essence, Jesus isn't trying to clarify Moses' teaching. He's abolishing it. The teaching on divorce and remarriage was, yes, a part of the law, but it was a concession and a deviation from God's true design. And our Lord, who is God, certainly has the right to reestablish the true teaching on marriage. So those are the three possible interpretations to the exception clause in Matthew 19, 9, except for unchastity, that are all in harmony with what Jesus teaches in Mark 10, verses 11 and 12, where there are no exceptions regarding divorce and remarriage in Mark's gospel. And that's what the church has always understood and taught to be our Lord's will regarding the marriage covenant. We'll close today's reflection just with a word on annulments as well. An annulment, what is that? Well, it's a declaration of matrimon matrimonial nullity. So it's an official determination that what appeared to be a marriage, in fact, really was not a marriage. So divorce is the breaking of the marriage contract. An annulment says there was really no contract there to begin with. There are three possible reasons for the church granting someone an annulment. One, at the time of the wedding, one or both of the parties to be married lacked sufficient capacity for marriage. That requires a whole explanation, which we won't get into. Two, one or both of the parties failed to give adequately their consent to the marriage as the church understands it and proclaims it. Or three, in weddings involving at least one Catholic, the parties violated the church's requirements of canonical form in getting married. Canonical form means that for the marriage of a Catholic to be valid, there must be present at the wedding either a bishop or a parish priest in his, in his parish or another priest or a deacon, duly, duly delegated, plus also two witnesses as well. Lay persons can be delegated at times to assist at marriage if there is a shortage of clergy. We read about the requirements of canonical form in canon law, canons 1108, verse 21123. Talks about their possible dispensations from the form as well. So I tell people you should talk to your pastor if you have any questions about a possible annulment, you should talk to your pastor first. Only if someone has had their marriage annulled are they free to remarry someone else. And obviously, if you're trying to get your marriage annulled, you shouldn't be dating anyone in the meantime. Why? Because technically you're still married. As far as everyone knows, you're still married, so you shouldn't be dating people until things are straightened out. So an annulment is not a Catholic divorce, for one. And two, when people say that the church grants far too many annulments this day, well, that might be true, but I would say don't worry about what's not up to you to control, okay? And don't be too quick to judge on these things. Leave the judgments in the hands of the church. We trust in God. We have to trust in the church in these matters as well. The people who handle the annulment process take their work seriously. They know what they're doing, and not everyone gets an annulment. 
Not everyone gets what they're asking for, so the church does take that seriously. Let's ask Our Lady for the grace to really heal broken hearts and broken marriages. Let's also ask her for the grace to get right with the Lord if our relationships that aren't according to how God wants them to be, if they're not the way that God wants them to be, if we're with someone and we shouldn't be, let's ask her for the grace to have the courage to make things right. Praise be Jesus and Mary now and forever.